In this lecture, we're going to discuss privacy in social networks. To do this, we'll particularly focus on Facebook as a starting place. It's the biggest social network out there with a billion users at this point, and most of the information on Facebook defaults to be public. What we're going to look at is something that you'll see in the book, but we'll actually talk through how privacy has evolved on Facebook. So what we can see on the y-axis here are different levels of accessibility for the information. We have friends, your network, all of Facebook, and all of the web. Now, this will shift a little bit in the middle. Networks used to be the main way of identifying yourself, and that switched. But in 2005, networks were there, and so you'll eventually see this row change to friends of friends. Across the top on the x-axis, we have different pieces of information. Basic profile information like your gender, your name, your photo, your list of friends, all of your profile, what's posted on your wall or your timeline at this point, photos, your birthday, and your contact information. So in 2005, your friends could always see all of your information. Your network had access to your basic information, your friends lists, your wall, and your photos, and everyone on Facebook could see your basic information. Now, these are default settings we're talking about, so it's possible that you could have restricted this to be more private, but if you didn't touch your privacy settings, this is how things were by default. In 2007, we get a shift where now the network is able to access all the information about you except your contact information, which is your street address, phone number, and email address. In November of 2009, we see a few switches. First, we now have friends of friends who are able to see information. Your friend list has become visible to all of Facebook, and everybody on the web, even if they don't have a Facebook account, is able to see your basic profile information. In December of 2009, a month later, Facebook made the switch to also make your friend list visible to everyone on the web. In 2010, they took a much bigger step. Now, all of your information was visible to everyone except for your birthday and your contact information. This is a really dramatic shift. Now, as this happened, Facebook did introduce more sophisticated privacy control mechanisms, but for people who are just leaving their privacy levels untouched, anything they post, and including the wall or your timeline now, every comment, every message that people have posted to you, all of that information is there for everyone on the web to see. The same goes for all the photos that you've posted. Anyone online can come in and look at your photos unless you've changed that information. And Facebook has done this on purpose. They've really made the argument that they think people should be sharing as much as possible and that that gives more power to what they're doing. And a couple summers ago, they introduced this thing called frictionless sharing, which really showed how far they were willing to take this. Frictionless sharing was something that was implemented, so if you clicked on an article that was linked to one of a handful of partners, including the Washington Post, you'd get a little message that would pop up asking if you wanted to go see the article, and if you didn't read it carefully and just clicked OK, it automatically signed you up for frictionless sharing. And what that would do is list every article that you clicked on in your profile. And those weren't articles that you clicked on on Facebook site. Those were articles that you would click on on the Washington Post site or on Yahoo News or a handful of other partners. So someone could go to your profile and see every article that you had clicked on in any of these partner websites. And then you would sometimes get articles that were aggregated and they would give you a list of your friends who had looked at them and you could see. This was a really uncomfortable thing for a lot of people. Most people who opted in didn't realize that they had signed in. Uh, the box was that came up that required you to opt in basically said you couldn't go see the article unless you clicked OK. And if you did click cancel on that box, it wouldn't take you to see the article. So it was this real barrier in the way of following links to news stories from Facebook. If you wanted to do that, you had to sign up. A lot of people didn't know that they had. And so they would go into their profiles and all of a sudden see this list of every article that they had clicked on. And if you think about your own browsing habits, a lot of times you'll click on things that aren't necessarily stuff that you would share with your friends. And maybe it's nothing to be particularly embarrassed by. It could be that you clicked on a gossipy kind of article, which isn't the normal thing you read, but the title was intriguing. 
And that's not the sort of thing that you'd want to share with people or publicize that you had read. But there were no filters on this. Facebook was just telling everyone everything that you had read. There's still an option to do this frictionless sharing with a thing called Social Reader, but it's not a default part of Facebook and it's not kind of stuck in your face like it was before. We'll talk about another website now, Pinterest, which a lot of you probably use. Um, this is a social image bookmarking website, so you can go anywhere on the web and pin something that you find. It requires you to post a picture. Uh, a lot of places have Pinterest links on them now so you can share the content, but they also have a little bookmarklet that you can use to let your browser automatically grab things. Users curate collections of images on boards, so it's sort of like an old school bulletin board where you can pin things. And it experienced really fast growth a couple of years, going from 1 million users to 12 million users in a pretty short period of time. Pinterest looks sort of like this. So there are some interesting things that came up with privacy and data ownership on Pinterest. At the time that it was experiencing this growth, their terms of service said that if you uploaded an image, that Pinterest was automatically granted a license to do whatever they wanted with that. Essentially, they were taking ownership of anything that you uploaded. And this was especially problematic because people would upload images that weren't theirs. They would find a cool picture on the web, pin it on Pinterest because it looked nice, and then Pinterest would say that they owned it. So you could be a professional photographer with pictures on your website. Someone else could put it on Pinterest, and then Pinterest would claim they had the right to use your image, even though you never granted Pinterest permission to do so. There's a big outcry about this, and eventually Pinterest revised their terms of service, so they're not claiming that anymore. But it's an interesting kind of thing where there, it's not so much an issue of who can see your information, because on Pinterest, everything is public by default, and you can make private boards that only a few people can see, but generally it's a very public platform. But the idea of who owns the data and what you retain after you give it to Pinterest, and in fact this is true for a lot of companies, is important. Another kind of service worth discussing are location-based services. So these are places where you're posting your location. Generally it's done with a mobile device that has a GPS built in. And you use that to find people and, and get benefits. Facebook has a location service where you can check in. Twitter allows you to post your location. And Foursquare um, is still pretty popular and one, was one of the first games that really allowed a lot of people to leverage this kind of check-in information. So on Foursquare, you could check in at stores, offices, monuments, airports. You could add any location you wanted, so you could put your house on Pinterest. And it was an example of this larger location sharing movement in social media. So here's an example of some check-in information. Um, I took this when I had gone to New Orleans. You can see that I'm at Louis Armstrong New Orleans International Airport. I'm checked in here. There's 47 people here. And after I checked in, I got this window that shows I'm checked in here, and it offers me a special that if I go to Concourse C, I can get a free luggage tag. Um, and this was something that a lot of places used on Foursquare. They would give you specials, so bars would give you a free basket of tater tots or 10% off your order. Uh, a lot of places had these kinds of specials. And then, based on the kind of check-in and where you did it, you'd get a certain number of points. And there was a leaderboard, so it was a sort of game in terms of who could get the most points. So if we start off looking at this screen after I've checked in, we can see that there's 47 other people here. And if I click on this tab, it shows me a list of all the other people. It says, you're here, and there's 46 other people here. If I click on one of those people, I can see their profile. So this is Lee from Washington, D.C. He probably came off the same flight that I did since we were both checked in at the airport at the same time. And I can see his friends. I can see that he has 2,622 check-ins, but since there's no arrow here, I can't see where he's checked in. And that's a good thing. He's not my friend, so I shouldn't be able to look at every single location he's been at. Badges are things that you can earn for checking in a certain number of places or to a certain number of places in a particular category, like 15 different pizza places. Um, but I can also see places that he's the mayor of. And you become a mayor of a place if you're the person who checks in there most often. So these are places that you tend to frequent a lot. 
Mayorships are public, so if I click on Lee's mayorships, I can see here are all the places where he's a mayor. Um, and we can see that these are places in DC. So here's a CVS pharmacy, there's a cab in Upper Northwest, the NIH Office of Extramural Research, and a few other places. This gives me a really good idea of where he lives and where he works because these are places that he's going pretty frequently. So mayorships don't necessarily tell me where he's been at which particular time, but they do tell me a lot of information about where he goes frequently. And it's kind of something where you can't control the privacy of it, yet it reveals a lot of private information about you. So overall, even though these location-based services tend to try to protect your data, through little things like mayorships, actually quite a bit of information can leak out that you might not want people to see, and you don't have any control over that. I want to tie Foursquare into Twitter. Most of you probably know uh, about Twitter at this point. It's a microblogging service, so you can post short messages called tweets that are limited to 140 characters. Um, there's a lot of active users. This 200 million is certainly outdated at this point. Uh, but about 40% of those people only read content, so they're not actively posting. Now, Foursquare has a feature where every time you check in, or if you become a mayor of some place, you can have it automatically post to Twitter. And this was something in the early days of Foursquare that people were doing a lot, and it was pretty annoying because you would see all of these messages from people saying where they had checked in on Foursquare. And in fact, it turns out that this is not a very safe thing to do because you're telling people where you are at every moment of the day. And to illustrate this, some guys set up this site called Please Rob Me, listing all those empty homes out there. And they would simply go through the main Twitter feed and look for any of these messages that were automatically posted by Foursquare. Since they're automatically generated, they all have the same format. And so you can see that we have a bunch of tweets that say so-and-so left home and checked in about a minute ago and then it shows where they checked in with the address. So you can see that all these people have left home, they're checked in somewhere else, and since people tend to use their real names on Twitter, the site would then allow you to search for their real name in a white pages directory using the location that they provided on Twitter so you could click on their icon and see a best guess of their home address. Now, there's actually no stories of people really being robbed using Please Rob Me, and the point of the site wasn't actually for anyone to get robbed, but rather to illustrate that it's probably not a wise idea to be revealing all of this information about yourself in a public forum like Twitter. The site's still uh, online, but isn't actively doing what they were doing before, and if you go there you can kind of see a message about what they were trying to show. One other thing that I want to add in here um, is actually research that I do on profiling people in relationships. So all the examples that I've given you so far are ways that information that you post in social media is shared with others, sometimes with people that you don't expect it to be shared with. But in fact, there's a lot of new computational techniques that are out there, and I'm working on developing some of these, that allow us to infer traits about users even if they're not explicitly stating it. So we can infer things like trust and tie strength on their relationships, even if they don't tell us anything explicitly about their relationships. And we can infer a lot of personal information about them. So examples of some things that, uh, that we can predict, things like age, race, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, drug and alcohol use, religion, and a lot more things like intelligence, political preferences, uh, personality traits and so on. Results from one study are shown here. This was a study in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences and what you're basically seeing is a measure of error for a whole list of different traits. This is interesting because this study only used people's likes on Facebook. So they didn't look at any of your profile information, any of your personal data. All they looked at were the things that you liked on Facebook and they were able to predict with different levels of accuracy all sorts of attributes, including all those ones that I listed on the previous slide. It's a great study. They had 65,000 people participate. So this isn't some little thing with a few people where it looks like they can guess. They had huge amounts of data, everyone giving them good ground truth on which they were able to base their predictions, and they did really well on a lot of different attributes. 
If this is interesting to you, I highly recommend you check this paper out. It's only four pages. It's really well written and easy to understand. Um, and it gives a great idea of how much information we can predict about people even from a very small slice of everything that they're sharing on social media. The likes are really a tiny part of what you do on Facebook, but it turns out that they can be really predictive and in ways that you might not even expect. So the takeaway message from this is that people share huge amounts of information about themselves and their relationships and their activities online, especially through social media. Using social media profiles, we can come up with all sorts of information. Um, we can get insights about people, what they say, what they do. We can use these computational techniques to find out additional information. But we can even use the information directly as it's provided to infer things, to make decisions about people, or to take advantage of the information that they're sharing. There's a lot more details about this in the book, and I've given you some additional readings that hopefully will shed some insight on this. And I hope if you haven't, after this lecture, you'll go in and check your privacy settings in all of your social media profiles to make sure that you're not sharing information with people that you didn't intend.